Hello, welcome. Since August 2021, the Taliban takeover of Afghanistan has launched a new chapter in contemporary history. On the ground at the time, a group of Dutch diplomats, civil servants, and military personnel were coordinating the evacuation of Dutch nationals and their allies. In the infamous Kabul airport, Dutch ambassador to Afghanistan found herself coordinating this effort. Today, we have the pleasure of inviting the last Dutch uh, ambassador to the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan um, to, with us to discuss burning questions surrounding diplomacy, its impact, its dangers, missions, and consequences. To help us better understand diplomacy in an increasingly unstable world, let us invite the last Dutch ambassador to Afghanistan to the stage, Cecilia Vikers. Hello. Hello. Welcome. Good afternoon. <clears throat> oh, welcome, Ms. Vikers. Uh, thank you very much for finding the time to be with us today. Um, and before we jump into the interview itself, uh, we wanted to first ask you how it's like being back in the Netherlands after so many years abroad. Oh, that's a complicated question. Good afternoon to you all. Good to see you. Um, I arrived at uh, the beginning of August uh, here in Amsterdam. Uh, I wanted to go back to Amsterdam because it still feels very international. I grew up in Limburg in the east, uh, but Amsterdam for me always had this kind of excitement. Um, why excitement? After many uh, years of hard work, I was uh, starting my sabbatical. So I'm actually having a lot of free time, um, and Amsterdam keeps me busy. So I have been playing a lot uh, my cello and double bass since then. I do my runs here in the park, mm -hmm. Rotterdam Park, and all a bit to get off the adrenaline. I've been working a lot, also in crisis situations, yep. and that's kind of addictive. Um, so at some point I thought, I need a break. So that's what I'm doing at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's difficult. But I like being in the Netherlands because things are well organized, you know. <laughs> Sometimes a bit boring, but at the same time, very much alive here in Amsterdam. You're probably very different also from what you've been used to, because since the 1990s, you've been abroad practically all the time, from Riga to Islamabad, from Havana to Kabul. Did any of these places have anything in common for you? I think um, all these places in the beginning, if I would read the capital, like Ouagadougou, Burkina Faso, I thought, that's a crazy name. I want to go there. So it has to do with curiosity. Um, I think uh, Pakistan and also Afghanistan later, they kind of induced a bit of fear in me, which means that I have to do it. There's something in me that says that... Um, uh, if there's something to learn and to do, to contribute, uh, this is something that motivates me. And I think also that through the years I really learned to conquer those fears, whatever they were, justified or not justified. It does help to go there, see for yourself, talk to people, get to know the country, um, and do your job well. Now, in 2012, you went to Afghanistan for the first time as a legal advisor to the Dutch police, uh, to the Dutch police mission in Kunduz. Uh, why did the Dutch, so we can understand, want to retain a military presence in the city? You mean uh, why the Dutch wanted to have uh, a military presence in Kunduz? Yes. Right. Um, 2012, that's a long time ago. That's uh, 10 years. It was a time that uh, countries were asked to contribute to the NATO mission in order to train police and military. And at that time, uh, we got together a civil, um, civilian military mission called uh, Police Training Mission Group 3 I participated in. That was um, a combination of the Marines, the Dutch police, but also diplomats. And that made it very interesting because um, we were there uh, to train the police, uh, but my job was to connect those kind of more um, in the field uh, type of exercises with the justice chain. So imagine that, for instance, in Kunduz, uh, there was a lot of uh, domestic violence going on at the time. Uh, the police uh, colleagues would train the local police how to deal with that, how to get uh, enough evidence, how to make a case, how to take care of victims. 
um, how to uh, train um, police to kind of make the case towards the prosecutor. And then I would come in with uh, programs that the Netherlands would finance and support. Um, and I would monitor those uh, programs. So I talked a lot with uh, judges, uh, lawyers, um, and try to kind of pull various cases as a practice through this whole justice chain. So you were strengthening the judiciary and the local police force. True. Um, but now, uh, with the knowledge of today, we all know what happened with Afghanistan. Uh, Kunduz, uh, the province, has suffered a lot uh, under violence uh, from Taliban uh, at first. Um, later also, it, it was just a, a conquering grounds of different forces. Uh, at the same time, the idea that uh, the justice system could be uh, uh, supported from uh, abroad, from, from by us, for instance, was something that uh, you could learn a lot of lessons uh, about. Was that something that was accepted? Because we know that the politics on the ground in Afghanistan, as far as we understand, vary. There is from institutionalized authorities to local village elders in more rural areas. How did you navigate these varying sources of political power? Well, uh, part of my job was also to keep in contact uh, with the different actors in the justice chain. So I visited a lot of judges, uh, lawyers, we went to prisons. Um, a part of it was also a lot of public awareness, is that people would know that they could get justice through the system. So the local radios were very important. Uh, Local radios, they offered free space uh, uh, to women, often. Uh, so this was extra interesting for me uh, to visit and to support. They were unique in that regard, perhaps? Say it again. Were the radios unique in that, in that regard? Uh, the what the radios needed? As a democratizing force, perhaps? Of course, uh, because radios, they can offer, for instance, programs where people can call in and uh, contribute, perhaps criticize. Uh, but to come back to the, uh, the more uh, Afghan context that we were operating mm -hmm. in, mm -hmm. is that my personal lesson of this whole uh, experience was that it takes time to get familiar with those that you have to work with. And if there is a security dimension, for instance, you have a bodyguard with you all the time, and when you, there's protection necessary, it's difficult to have that connection. So it takes time to understand each other and yeah. what people need. And I think there I would like to make the connection that if you want to do justice, it's not only about the formal system, mm -hmm. it's much more about the recognition of people who have suffered injustice. And it's up to them to also tell us how uh, they can come to peace within. And aside from this more like security aspect that you're describing, was there, for instance, a more cultural aspect? Did you maybe ever feel personally um, un unwelcomed in any circumstances when working on these missions? Um, I think what's important to notice is that, of course, I'm a woman. Uh, I, I get this question a lot as a female diplomat, uh, also in Islamic context, uh, but also other more uh, traditional contexts, for instance, rural areas, where uh, women there are not coming uh, out of the houses so much. This is not only happening in Afghanistan, it's also happening elsewhere. So when you come in as a woman, um, uh, it's more the position at that particular time that uh, strikes people. Uh, so for instance, if I'm an ambassador, it's not Cecilia, the woman who comes in, but it's more uh, Cecilia, the mm -hmm. ambassador, yeah, who is representing something at this particular time in the conversation, or uh, when you... Uh, are there to do your to do your job so there is a difference uh, between the two i never personally um, uh, experienced uh, the feeling that i was ignored because i'm a woman okay it's just that you have to adapt also yourself the fact that some uh, nationalities they cannot shake your hand for whatever reason so you do this it's fine uh, sometimes it's better to wear a veil. Mm -hmm. Fine. About respecting local uh, culture? Yeah. yeah, I think Adapting. it has to do with respect. And uh, at the same time, there are limits, of course. Mm -hmm. I'm Dutch. So uh, uh, 
when it comes to freedom of expression, yeah. these kinds of things, it's not so easy to compromise on that. Yes, um, now taking it back to the mission, um, how, what was your level of confidence then in the Afghan police once your uh, training was over and once you've completed this Dutch mission? Well, our mission uh, was highly ambitious in the sense is that uh, the Dutch, they put a lot of people uh, per uh, police uh, officer, which means a lot of personal attention and also a lot of uh, police, uh, how do you call it, um, uh, secu uh, local security. So a lot working with communities, like we also do that here in the Netherlands, where the police is expected to hear uh, what people need. And then they would... Uh, uh, try to uh, offer the services. This was something that was not common at the time in uh, Afghanistan. So I can only hope that the way we trained, that uh, we instilled some knowledge and experience in those who were in the programs. We all know is that cycles of violence uh, followed. And so the militarization of the security forces was mm -hmm. a consequence. So this is really a pity. Uh, and I can only say is that our mission was pretty short. I think if it would have been longer, we would have also had uh, more impact. We know that with, with the power of the post-mission evaluation, you published, and hindsight perhaps, that there was rampant corruption in the judiciary and the police force. And coupled with the high cost of this mission, uh, I wanted to ask you, were you at the time knowingly funding a, co a corrupt police force? Is this something that emerged later? Well, I think working in these kinds of contexts means automatically you have to deal with corruption. And the only way you can do that is to be very transparent yourself and keep also appealing to those that you're working with what your norms and values are when it comes to uh, corruption. Uh, but if you uh, would tell uh, as a diplomat or as any other person of NGOs that you cannot work in corrupt contexts, hmm, then uh, there are not many contexts left, I think. I think it's part of crisis, part of the effect of war, mm -hmm. is that people uh, start to fend for themselves. So Afghanistan is known as a uh, country that's suffering uh, from corruption, although under the current de facto regime, the Taliban, their, uh, their um, what can, how should I call it, their uh, results that they pride themselves on uh, is that they uh, decreased uh, corruption. Uh, and I hear also that mm -hmm. that's, that's uh, is in many cases true. That is uh, the case. As, as there is yeah. more uh, control. Um, and, but anyways, I think corruption is a human um, phenomenon that in whatever context you are, at some point it will peep up. Mm -hmm. Same here in yeah. this country. Yes. Uh, same where else, everybody, everywhere else. And um, aside from that corruption, I, uh, you've mentioned another factor that I think contributed to the weakening of this mission, which was the fact that it wasn't long-lasting. It wasn't mm -hmm. as long as it could have been to achieve the optimal results. That being said, with the high cost involved, which was around, um, as Volskrant reported, 500,000 euros per officer that was paid, and corruption in mind, do you think that this mission failed in some aspects, or did it succeed in some aspects? Well, um, I don't think it's up to me to say whether the mission has succeeded or failed. Mm -hmm. What I do know is that while working on the ground, uh, we uh, touched people. Um, and I think when it comes to transfer of knowledge, training, uh, the fact that we had uh, very much a dedicated force there of the police and the Marines by the time that I worked there, um, I can look back uh, at kind of a for me successful mm -hmm. mission. And I think there, this is an interesting question you're posing me because also when it comes to uh, my uh, last two years of work uh, in Afghanistan, the big question, was it a big failure? Have you, do you feel terribly uh, bad about what we have done there? No. Um, I think what's important in these crisis situations is to know your role. Um, and I try to do the best of my ability to fulfill that role. Mm -hmm. And at the time, that was the most the Dutch could also provide. 
considering the circumstances. That's, that's uh, how I would like to phrase it. Mm -hmm. um, this, the mission in Kunduz was uh, difficult because of the situation locally, yeah. uh, but we also were very much limited when it came to the mandate. That mm -hmm. was so, um, yes, lessons learned, uh, but we have to fast forward. It's yes. 10 years ago, <laughs> and Afghanistan at this particular time is in a deep humanitarian crisis mm -hmm. that needs uh, now a complete different uh, approach from our side as well. I want to take it uh, perhaps 10 years later then, or eight years later, after such a demanding and frustrating mission in Kunduz, as we've just covered, you, in 2012, you returned to Afghanistan as ambassador in, in 2020. How come? Um, I thought about it already before. Um, I focused uh, the ministry at some point on uh, UN missions, um, was interested in uh, civilian military cooperation, uh, which uh, brings to the forefront what we're good at and the way we can connect. We need each other in order to address um, crisis. So how come I came back to, the, to, to Afghanistan? It had to do also, I think, again, with uh, conquering some fear in me. Um, the first time that I was ambassador was in Burundi, in uh, the east of Africa. And uh, this is a country that has also a lot of challenges when it comes to... Um, Victimhood, cycles of violence, how do you deal with that um, as international partners who want to support the Burundian uh, population? Um, and similar thoughts uh, I had when I thought about Afghanistan. So this time around, after Burundi, I thought I was ready mm -hmm. uh, to go because in the postings beforehand, all these different aspects, uh, I kind of practiced. So I felt ready to do so. More prepared in a way? <laughs> How well prepared can you be for a situation like this? Um, but when I uh, arrived, I felt uh, right at home. It had to do also with my Afghan colleagues, mm -hmm. uh, as they were very motivated to contribute. And same here. What was the situation on, on the ground uh, eight years after your initial, initial visit? Was there any difference? Did you notice any meaningful differences or changes? Yes, of course. I think a lot uh, changed by the time that I arrived. That was in 2020. It was a time that uh, the negotiations in Doha uh, were still uh, ongoing between uh, the team of the uh, Afghan Republic uh, and the Taliban that was uh, following the uh, agreement between the US and Taliban. Mm -hmm. So already uh, what was going to happen was already a bit uh, in the works. We were, it was happening while I was there. And we all hoped is that Afghans themselves, when it came to also Afghan victims, and that's almost everybody, basically, that they would be implicated in the talks uh, in Doha at the time. And until the very much the eve of uh, the fall of Kabul in August 2021, these teams were still trying to come to an agreement. Mm -hmm. Because that the Taliban would take over more and more of the country. Of course, we saw that. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, we did not see it coming with such a speed. We all thought at some point there would be some kind of agreement between the different uh, teams. In 2020, did the, the local population you were uh, speaking to, did they seem enthusiastic in defending uh, the republic as it was at the time from the Taliban? I don't understand the question. Say it again. Were the, the, the local population in 2020, were they enthusiastic in defending the country from the Taliban? So maybe the local police and the ANA and everything? What was your perception of that? Well, um, by that time, the country was already uh, pretty much divided in the sense yeah. that uh, the population was very much suffering from the violence. Mm -hmm. When I uh, worked in Kabul, um, <clears throat> It was kind of a daily menu of attacks in the city <clears throat> and elsewhere in the country, which meant that we were dealing with that yes. instead of uh, development or support to uh, uh, groups in society who needed it. Mm -hmm. So uh, the population was tired of yeah. uh, the violence. So this was a deep desire that we all understand. And the Taliban were promising this kind of stability. Mm -hmm. But there was the attraction. Then also, uh, uh, historically, uh, uh, 
politically, geographically, the county was also divided between more Taliban type of support mm -hmm. um, and more republic support. So there also, there were, uh, of course, tensions. Internal tensions, yeah. yeah. And navigating with such a backdrop, such a background, and, and so many things going on at once, we have the negotiations, mm -hmm. we also have internal sort of rifts and tensions. What was your job uh, this time around as an ambassador? Well, uh, when I came, my main uh, job was to focus on our programs contributing to stability and rule of law. Mm -hmm. um, but it was clear that with the uh, handover or the transition in, uh, foreseen in August 2021 mm -hmm. uh, and the, the increasing tension, that we had to focus on security. Yeah. Which meant that um, we had to uh, look into our own, uh, our own Afghan colleagues, mm -hmm. what was happening to them, uh, the Dutch community, uh, the military still left in Afghanistan who were contributing to the mission. Yes. So also there, security came on number one because you need security first before you can do your job. Mm -hmm. um, it was part of my job at that time. To, prov to provide the security and... Well, to uh, make sure that we had the right scenarios prepared. Mm -hmm. uh, and as we did not know exactly what was going to happen after August, uh, it meant that we went through a lot of exercise, different discussions also with the ministry here in The Hague, <coughs> of how to protect ourselves best in order to be able to stay. Because that was the intention. Well, it, yeah, and that said, how confident were you back then with these security concerns, confident in the local government? Well, um, uh, when you are a diplomat, uh, security is then the responsibility of your host government. So at some point you have to trust that they will uh, protect you. Uh, at that time, of course, the NATO forces were still present, which meant also is that when it came to quick reaction forces, mm -hmm. um, how to get out if you get injured, these kinds of things, there were systems for that uh, based upon agreement between uh, NATO allies. Mm -hmm. uh, once uh, NATO uh, was uh, decreasing its presence, of course, we were thinking about how to replace these kinds of more uh, security and, and guarantees for uh, foreign presence in Kabul. Okay. But as the, as the NATO forces uh, were perhaps uh, leaving the country, was uh, the ability of the Afghan government to maintain uh, this security lessened as well? The, the, local, the local army, was it capable? Were you confident in their ability to withstand the Taliban? Well, the Afghan um, uh, security and defense forces, they were uh, well trained. Um, so they had uh, good people there. Mm -hmm. At the same time, they were under an increasing pressure by the Taliban. Um, so they, of course, at some point, their force uh, decreased. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to confidence, at some point, you have to also take your own measures. Hence, we had also prepared these evacuation scenarios. Okay. Eight years before that, you were in Kunduz, training the local police, uh, strengthening the judiciary, ultimately trying to stop a Taliban advance. Eight years later, you found yourself in Kabul, again, in front of an advancing Taliban. Right. How does that feel? Um, how did that feel? How did that feel? Um, yeah, you know, when you are uh, in Kabul, you are, I was living in a compound. Um, it was also COVID time, don't, uh, uh, don't forget. So we were limited by security and by COVID when it came to our freedom of movement and to truly get out uh, out of our compounds, we did, but not out of Kabul. So my time uh, in Afghanistan as an ambassador, we could not visit elsewhere. Mm -hmm. The security was that bad at that uh, time. So then what do you do? Uh, you concentrate on those who still are courageous in civil society. You uh, concentrate on diplomacy. You mm -hmm. talk to uh, those in the government. Um, and try to support them when it comes to uh, security and stability. So um, diplomacy is a lot about relating, about um, transferring your message. And our message was about you have to talk to each other. You have to come to an agreement. 
you have to try to be inclusive. Mm -hmm. Inclusivity is kind of a key word uh, in Afghanistan, also now under the current Taliban regime, mm -hmm. where we feel and where a lot of people feel that they are not inclusive enough. Um, as they are uh, very much focused on one particular ethnicity and not enough uh, reaching out to others. Um, yeah. The de facto regime, of course, uh, they, they feel they are, uh, but there are a lot of voices uh, who say that they aren't. And with this conversation at the time you were doing diplomacy <laughs> locally, to, trying to negotiate with, at the time, the local government, but did you also enter negotiations then with the Taliban? No. At that particular time, uh, we were not. Okay. Um, and I think this would be a good time, perhaps, yes. to look for some audience questions, if that's okay. That's very uh, fine. Do we have any audience questions? Yeah. Great. Good. We have one. Here uh, in front. We have a microphone that is coming up to you, so please just speak into the microphone. I know it's very quickly, so in a moment. Right over there. Um. Okay, um, this is a bit more of a like a um, lifestyle of a diplomat question. Um, I, I don't know if you have family or if you also knew fellow diplomats who had family. How did it feel like when you had to leave or when things started to change politically and there were many tensions? How did you deal with that having family if they were also living with you in Afghanistan? That's a very good question. Um, my family is... Uh, uh, is used to traveling around. I have three kids. Um, uh, they are 23, 22, and 20. And they have become, meanwhile, also world citizens. My oldest was born in Islamabad, uh, the second one also in that time, and the third one during my time in Burkina Faso. So uh, they grew up uh, as very open-minded individuals. Um, and for them now, the world is like, uh, uh, like I was as a girl, taking the train from Nijmegen to Amsterdam was a big thing. Well, they take just the plane to anywhere and uh, they can deal with that. Uh, so it's only, not only about logistics, but it's only also about being open-minded, which I like a lot, I think, about this, what we call uh, third culture kids, eh? they're, mm -hmm. they're, they're called. How did they react? I think uh, when they um, heard I wanted to go to Kunduz, my kids were a bit afraid um, because they knew that there was uh, some risk. And of course, I got extra questions by journalists. Why, as a mother, you go to a dangerous place? Um, and I always answered because I think that I can contribute. I really want to contribute. Uh, I want to learn. Um, and I hope I can inspire my kids to do something similar when it comes to courage. And I think that's another thing, is that um, uh, I used to be very afraid of many things, uh, but my diplomatic career really helped me to get over it and to tackle that. So um, that was Kunduz. They were small then. Now they are young adults. And uh, during the crisis last year, when I was at the airport, um, of course they were very much worried. And I remember very well that uh, the Thursday evening when suicide attack took place and I was still at the airport waiting for the last plane to get us out, my daughter called uh, just before I stepped into the car. And that was very good because I could say I was okay. Uh, but it indicated to me is that, of course, what I'm doing has a lot of impact on my people. Um, but then, does that mean that you should not do it? Yeah, the answer is, of course, no. Uh, you have to do where your calling is. And for me, at that particular time, I was exactly where I wanted to be. Okay. Uh, another question, maybe? Hi, I'm Rida. I'm from Pakistan. So we have had a complicated relationship with the NATO invasion because it resulted in a great uh, addition of terrorism in our country as well, like it was a, slip, a spillover. So my question is a bit critical. Uh, for me, it's hard to differentiate between the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan with the emergence of Mujahideen 
and the invasion of Afghanistan by the NATO allies with the emergence of Taliban as a result. How are policy objectives different as both invasions ended with a destabilized country uh, left behind? I think they are very different. Um, both uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, they are interlinked. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, families know each other. The time that I started in Pakistan, I remember uh, that was still under the Afghanistan of the Taliban rule. Uh, a lot of Afghans uh, would come to Pakistan. Um, and now again, it's Pakistan, Iran and Turkey who uh, receive most of the Afghan uh, refugees. So what is different about it? I think, um, uh, of course, um, in 2001, um, uh, with the attack on the Twin Towers, uh, it uh, provoked a reaction um, by the U.S., supported by its allies. Um, and I think in those 20 years that we were there, uh, we were there in different ways, uh, militarily, uh, diplomatically, but also development-wise. And I think in the 20 years that we were there, uh, we could uh, touch a lot of people. And I think especially a lot of women and girls when it comes to access to education, these were one of the things that we could say, perhaps we have contributed to that, that more girls could go to school. Um, I also do believe is that um, we have um, worked uh, together in such a way when it comes to the more development and political side, is that um, there are enough people still who want to contribute to the future of Afghanistan. Some of them are still there uh, in civil society and elsewhere. Others are in diaspora. So um, it's, it's not finished yet. That's how I feel, is that the story is going to continue. If you compare it to uh, the time that the Russians were there and the Mujahideen uh, fought against them, um, that was a different time. Uh, I think the Mujahideen at some point, they developed themselves as leaders that also were dominating the political landscape in, uh, in Afghanistan. And they still kind of kept their uh, power or influence spheres uh, during the last uh, 20 years. But now, if you look at it now, things have changed, I think, with uh, uh, the regime under Taliban, where um, also within civil society, I see younger people coming up, uh, women also, still, even if it's difficult. Um, so I, I, I think that in the coming uh, era, other things are going to happen in Afghanistan. Not sure what, but it's, I think we, there, there, hopefully there is an opportunity to come out of these cycles of violence. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you stated that your time in Afghanistan as, as, your, as ambassador can be summed up as a before and after the fall of Kabul. We've covered the before quite extensively, but now for the after, your evacuations and emergency responses and coordination with the military, the Dutch military. Were you prepared for this? Uh, yes and no. Uh, yes, because I knew that it would be tough. Uh, I had gone through the different scenarios with my team with the ministry, different uh, ways of uh, get, uh, to, uh, to get vulnerable groups out. But then uh, the acceleration in the crisis caught us by surprise. And the Netherlands was not the only country uh, that happened to uh, the whole international community. Uh, the Taliban and the Republic included, huh? uh, when we heard uh, afterwards that they also were surprised by this. Um, when it comes to preparation, uh, in crisis and post-crisis situations, you practice, uh, you inform. Um, but this one, uh, I'm not sure we could really prepare for. Uh, because the whole scenario that we would uh, be at the airport, dealing with so many people who wanted to get out of the country at the same time, the excruciating suffering of people in front of those walls trying to get in, um, that was something that, of course, one is never prepared for. It was difficult to prepare for how fast uh, everything went from a certain point on. How fast, but also how complicated. Uh, as you know, um, 
uh, a lot of missions had to fly out uh, their diplomats uh, mm -hmm. at some point as security could not be guaranteed anymore in Kabul city. This happened when uh, President Ghani uh, left the country yeah. and the yeah. Taliban uh, could get into the city much quicker than we uh, had at, uh, anticipated. Mm -hmm. So we had to withdraw to the airport. Yes. Uh, so and that perfectly segues into our, our next question, which is that this, these images of the Kabul airport and the evacuations, the airlifts were very widely spread at the time in 2021. Um, how was the situation for someone on the ground? As you previously mentioned, your daughter called you at the time when you were still in the car driving. How did it feel to have this so close to you? Um, you know, when you are working with the finest military, which I was, uh, with uh, our colleagues from the uh, Corps of uh, Commandos, um, Marsov, so different, uh, the Air Force, um, as a diplomat, uh, you have to find how to be complementary to them and the other way around. Mm -hmm. um, my added value was that I had lived in Kabul mm -hmm. and that I had prepared uh, various scenarios um, that I knew people. You know, mm -hmm. my uh, embassy team and their family, they were standing outside these walls. Um, and my team had different communication uh, channels. Um, the added value of the military was, of course, that they are super trained military who can deal with many uh, situations under stress, mm -hmm. under severe distress. But also, um, what is interesting about crisis work is that you have to use your creativity because it's never straightforward. You have to think about if this is not possible, that is not possible, uh, this has a bigger risk, mm -hmm. or we have to try it this way, yeah. and then adjust while you are working. So that type of work, it's um, very demanding. Mm -hmm. You shouldn't do it too often and too long. Um, but what it gave to me is that I uh, have uh, got the optimum of what I had to offer. Mm -hmm. So when I was working, I was super focused yeah. uh, on getting the job done. So that meant every day again to look how many people are on these lists? Which airplanes are coming in? Uh, how do we get to them? Mm -hmm. uh, as many of you know, uh, this has had a huge impact also here in the Netherlands because a lot of people are connected to Afghanistan. And Afghanistan is emotion. It's very emotional for people. Mm -hmm. They know Afghans, they've been there. If you look at the Dutch Foreign Service, almost everybody has done something with Afghanistan as we are there already since such a long time. And that said, you, you shared your experience coordinating with the Dutch military. Did you by any chance have the need to cooperate or discuss, um, coordinate your evacuations with the Taliban? Or was that separate? Um, at the time, uh, we did not. Um, mm -hmm. This was done by NATO, yes. uh, NATO and uh, US, uh, because of course people had to come from uh, Kabul, mm -hmm. city Kabul, into the airport. So imagine you had uh, Kabul airport, which was secured then still by the NATO allies, and just outside uh, the wall, uh, the Taliban had their own fighters, um, kind of uh, trying to regulate uh, access to yeah, mm -hmm. the airport. In fact, today is the last day, as far as we understand, that Dutch allies can apply for for evacuation uh, from the Dutch government in Afghanistan. Are you still involved in any way? No, I'm not involved when it comes to um, uh, the transition or the transfer of people still on the so-called uh, lists. Mm -hmm. um, this has to do with the fact that I could uh, restart uh, in Doha. So when the crisis uh, happened, I came back uh, to the Netherlands, reassembled the team and make, made kind of a uh, a restart uh, from Qatar mm -hmm. uh, and other colleagues, they uh, managed uh, the transfer uh, mission mm -hmm. yeah. from the ministry. Okay. So this was complicated because, as some of you know, politically this was sensitive in the Netherlands uh, from, uh, the, from Parliament, uh, but also through discussions with civil society. Uh, there were many people uh, who were in need of protection. So this group became rather big. Mm -hmm. And also because the 
uh, cooperation uh, with the de facto regime was not uh, an easy one. Uh, a lot of things had to happen in order to get people here. Um, and to go briefly, what was at the time the results of your evacuation? Were you satisfied with what had happened at the time? Um, the result was is that uh, we uh, could get many more people out than we originally thought we had to. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, there are different uh, figures, but around 2,300, 2,500 people went through uh, the Dutch uh, uh, mission Board at the airport. Uh, but this was uh, an exercise that we did with our NATO allies. Mm -hmm. So we would uh, work a lot together with the Belgians, for instance, uh, with the Germans, with French, with others. Uh, and when there were places to fill in airplanes, we would take each other's citizens. Um, Are you satisfied with those results at the end of the day, of this cooperation and the evacuation? Of course, you're never satisfied when something happens like this. For me, um, uh, what happened at the airport was a real uh, game changer of life changer for me, uh, as it was so big. And uh, of course, we could only do what we could do within my mandate and my role. And I think a way uh, to uh, deal with these kinds of crises is to think about the human dimension. Uh, human dimension in a sense, for whom are you doing this exactly? Uh, for people who needed protection at that time. Uh, a human dimension about myself, uh, as it is never enough. So you have to think about what was my role and have I done my optimum best with my team to fulfill that role. Um, and then the other human dimension of it is of course, those who have been going through this crisis our Afghan colleagues and people who needed that protection, we have to be good to them. So those who are here in the Netherlands, um, it's a question also, if you know uh, an Afghan refugee or somebody mm -hmm. uh, who has arrived, reach out. they rather be at home, I can assure you. Uh, and it's pretty tough to start anew here. Um, but obviously there were a lot of successes and, and you already mentioned that the number of people that you were able to get out was higher than anticipated. However, there were people that were still left behind. And how do you process that some were never evacuated? Um, I think what's important to realize is that, um, um, uh, yes, they were left behind uh, because they wanted to be protected. Um, uh, and we should do our utmost best uh, to, to, to support them. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, when you look at Afghanistan as a country, all people are needed in order to make the society get back into balance. Because what has happened also is that critical voices uh, of those who need a protection, so that's really something that I want to underline, of course. But because they are now in diaspora, they are less effective in the discussion mm -hmm. with the mm -hmm. de facto regime. So this is a, a real thing uh, where uh, we have to look also as um, uh, foreign missions to look how we can support who, who chose to stay mm -hmm. and also new voices who are standing up, because they are there. Mm -hmm. yeah. But ultimately, we now know that during the Taliban offensives, the Afghan National Army, the local police, the Prime Minister himself, at the end, abandoned their post without the most meaningful resistance. The army that the Western Alliance and the state that the Western Alliance was building collapsed in around two months. Why didn't the Afghan government or republic fight for its people? I think it had to do with uh, that uh, also uh, the pressure, the increasing pressure that they were under, uh, it was felt. And uh, you know how this goes, is that once the leader uh, at some point uh, takes uh, a distance by leaving the country, I think that was for many a sign that they also had uh, to save their own mm -hmm. affairs and uh, their own persons and their own families. That's a little bit how it works. So I you think, started mentally. from the top, you think? Started from the top? The well, um, it was clear is that the Taliban had uh, uh, already contacts also locally in various provinces, etc. And it connects to what I uh, was saying earlier about all the Afghan people wanted is stability and peace. And at some point, uh, this need comes at any cost. 
Um, mm. So this is uh, what has happened in the month after the Taliban takeover. The country was much better accessible than ever. So I heard from uh, Afghan uh, uh, colleagues and people I know, they could travel anywhere they wanted and nothing was happening, which was not possible before. The stability was brought, essentially. Yes, but point. also because of the absence of uh, Taliban type of attacks. So you, mm -hmm. have, to, you have to kind of turn it around. Uh, these days, things have changed a bit. We see uh, an upcoming uh, ISIS threat mm -hmm. uh, with attacks. So also, security-wise, things are not the best at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that being said, you also had a lot of efforts prior to the Taliban takeover in helping uh, the rule of law, women rights, and education locally. Yet they were more or less sidelined when the Taliban took over. How do you feel about that aspect? Because you've said that the Taliban did bring in some stability to the region, and there are some plus sides, nevertheless, but there are also massive downsides to it. Yes, uh, human rights, uh, of course, um, have been uh, infringed upon enormously mm -hmm. under the current regime, and this is something that we have to keep working on and also to support those who are still there or who would try to contribute uh, from abroad. Mm -hmm. So uh, we all know, um, those who know Afghanistan is of course the former um, Afghan Independent Human Rights Commission, <clears throat> a very important tool in checks and balances in uh, Afghan society. Uh, this commission has stopped uh, functioning, but um, its people, uh, they are still working on human rights. Mm -hmm. So. These kinds of um, uh, initiatives uh, we can still support. Um, when it comes to women, well, you have all seen perhaps uh, the, the brave young women who are literally banging on the doors of their secondary schools, uh, shouting they want to be uh, let in. Um, Is there a way for you to support those uh, women still to this day? Well, there are many uh, initiatives in order to support more informal education. Mm -hmm. So you have community-based education, you have, of course, online. But uh, all these different initiatives, they are not enough uh, to be sustainable. Yep. And I think this is also uh, true about the whole exercise when it comes uh, to humanitarian aid. The, the budget uh, the, for this year is 4.4 billion US dollars mm -hmm. that is asked. It's not enough. You have to uh, work at some point uh, on development, on more long term. And for that, you uh, need to uh, engage. Brings us, sorry, this brings us yeah. to our next question, that uh, even though Afghanistan is under Taliban control, deteriorating human rights and violence is perhaps increasing. We also see an ISIS, resurging, an ISIS resurgence. Excuse me. But in light of this, is there anything that is making you hopeful for Afghanistan's future, on the other hand? I think in these scenarios, uh, you never have to give up hope. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with the Afghan population. I think also my government has underlined that time and time and again, the fact that we are still engaged and still um, uh, dealing uh, with the current situation, uh, also with our like-minded uh, involved in engagement with the de facto regime, is the Afghan population. What would it take then for the Netherlands to reestablish diplomatic relations with the de facto regime? Um, well, we are very far away from that. Uh, mm -hmm. The current regime is not recognized by any country. Can you imagine? We are now more than a year uh, along uh, since they, uh, the Taliban took over. So the fact that also um, Islamic countries, regional players, bigger players, uh, are not recognizing the current regime is a sign. So that means that uh, all these different things that we find important, which mm -hmm. is inclusivity, which is uh, respect for human rights, which is access to humanitarian services, which is uh, safe passage, people there are allowed to get out, uh, mm -hmm. and which is uh, that the Taliban shows that they are uh, taking enough measures to prevent that Afghanistan will become, again, a basis for terrorists. Mm -hmm. These are just uh, a couple of points that we repeat again and again in our talks uh, to the de facto regime. Mm -hmm. 
And that said, so far in the 2020s, we've also been faced with an array of crises, which includes the fall of Kabul, protests currently in Iran, Russia's war against Ukraine, COVID-19. How have all of these events and these uncertainties redefined uh, diplomacy? Well, um, uh, I'm happy to say is that from my country, at least, we have a, a two-year ahead vision mm -hmm. uh, with also budget attached, where we use different instruments in order to support uh, the African population. But we cannot deny uh, the impact, of course, of the crisis of uh, Ukraine uh, on uh, the, diff the, the various uh, problems in Afghanistan. Um, but it must be said also is that in the end, a durable solution has to come from within. Mm -hmm. So our hope should be directed towards an intra-Afghan dialogue mm -hmm. with those who are uh, in diaspora, but also who are inside, uh, that they are speaking to each other. And this is something that we don't see enough, mm -hmm. uh, but which is also very hard to enforce. Something bottom-up, right? It's bottom-up, but it's also that uh, various leaders, uh, talking about various leaders also in the past, who are still uh, playing a, a, a big role, take the lead in that and mm -hmm. uh, start that conversation. Uh, because if there's anything that we believe in as diplomats, it's also is that you have to uh, keep talking. There is no way to shut the door and the windows and everything else, uh, because there's no other alternative. This is what we do. And that said, um, would you still like to return to active diplomacy? Of course. I, uh, I hope even that I could return to Kabul. Uh, oh. So let's see would if that happens. Would that be happens. the next post you want? Uh, would you like to return? We'll see how that goes. But um, this is something that I promised myself, is mm -hmm. that there's still uh, things to contribute. Um, and uh, I don't know how it works with you, but once you have been several times in the same country or the same region, it gets to you, it gets under your skin, and uh, you start to understand more, which means that you can have a bigger impact. So my inner motivation uh, comes from there. Mm -hmm. This seems like a nice point to end it. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to our audience, and thank you, Ambassador Advisors, for answering our questions. Room for Discussion is back on stage tomorrow at 12 p.m. with Nick Savi to discuss AI in education. Then on November the 11th, we will be hosting the CEO of Amsterdam Stock Exchange, Simone Hauser in Veld. And finally, on November 15th, join us for our interview with Franz Müller, the CEO of Achold Delhauser, owner of Albert Hein and Bold.com. Thank you, and see you soon. With that said, thank, thank you. you so much.